A few years ago, Universal announced a new cinematic universe based on their golden age of horror. They called it the Dark Universe. The first film out was The Mummy, starring Tom Cruise. It was a critical failure, and it underperformed at the box office. The Dark Universe was put on hold. Some blamed the quality of the first film, while others pointed out that The Mummy was front-loaded with too much setup of future films, thus muddying the waters. My name is Jekyll. Dr. Henry Jekyll. But perhaps there were other reasons as well. Let's explore them, and while doing so, we'll take a look at the origins of the mummy genre. The cinematic mummy first awakened during Universal's aforementioned golden age of horror. Despite the creature's ancient nature, it was at the time a modern and contemporary monster, more so than his brethren Dracula and Frankenstein's monster. The mummy, made in 1932, didn't have a direct literary pedigree. Instead, it was ripped from the headlines. In November 1922, archaeologist Howard Carter discovered the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. He had been searching for it for years, financed by Lord Carnarvon. But the Egyptian expeditions had been complicated by a world war, as well as other factors. Lord Carnarvon was growing wary, demanding results. At the start of the 1922 season, Carnarvon told Carter that this would be his last sponsored year in Egypt so he had better make it count. Howard Carter did. Not only did he discover Tutankhamun's tomb, but when he found it, the tomb was undisturbed. You see, the tombs of the ancient pharaohs of Egypt were popular with looters. And let's be honest, the British in general were looting Egypt for all it was worth. That, one could argue, includes Mr. Carter and Carnarvon. The British declared Egypt a protectorate as early as 1882. Who were the British protecting Egyptians from? Mostly from themselves, it seems, as the British were kind enough to extend this courtesy not only to Egypt, but to nations all over the world, leading to the saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. A joke was soon born. Why does the sun not set on the British Empire? Because God wouldn't trust them in the dark. When Howard Carter and company opened the tomb, they discovered nobody had been inside it since it was sealed 2,300 years earlier. The first time Carter looked inside, Lord Carnarvon asked him, Do you see anything? Carter's reply was, Yes, wonderful things. The tomb was filled with loot, but most important of all, it had the mummified remains of the young pharaoh. It was the best preserved pharaohic tomb ever discovered. The world was already in the grips of an Egypt craze, and with the subsequent coverage in the press, people ate up the reports from the exotic land. It was only a matter of time before horror writers and filmmakers hopped on the bandwagon. In fact, they already had, though mostly in a fantasy veneer. In the 1918 melodrama Eyes of the Mummy, we had already seen the mysticism of Egypt exploited. And Irish author Bram Stoker, he of Dracula fame, had in 1903 written the novel The Jewel of Seven Stars, where the spirit of the Egyptian queen Terra seems to possess the daughter of the Egyptologist who discovered Terra's tomb. But neither of these stories were a direct influence on the 1932 film. Yes, there was some overlap, at least with the concept of reincarnation and the theme of possession by ancient souls. However, it seems like screenwriter John Boulderston and Universal Pictures were far more interested in a contemporary take, courtesy of Howard Carter. The opening scene of the film takes place ten years before the main plot. As the film is set in 1932, that means the prologue is in 1922, the same year Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon made their discovery. Oh, and then there's that little thing about a curse upon anyone desecrating the tomb. Inscriptions of curses on tombs were rare, and no such curse was found in the hieroglyphs at Tutankhamun's tomb. However, that didn't stop the press from engaging in a tabloid feeding frenzy when Lord Carnarvon died some months after the tomb was first opened. Had he been killed by a curse? Was everyone who entered the tomb doomed? No, not really. What actually happened was that Lord Carnarvon was bitten by a mosquito. He shaved, reopening the wound, which in turn became infected, killing him. 
The press ignored the fact that mosquitoes are the biggest killer of humans among all animals. They also ignored the high death rates of Europeans exploring Africa. There was no curse. Howard Carter was still very much alive at this point. He even celebrated his discovery with a popular lecture series across the United States. But why let the truth get in the way of a good story? Hollywood certainly didn't. The Mummy launched several of the tropes we today see in Mummy cinema, and none of the later adaptations seem to have broken away from the blueprint created by the 1932 original. The story follows High Priest Imhotep, who is resurrected by the inadvertent reading of a scroll. He spends the next decade masquerading as an Egyptian named Ardeth Bey. Once his plans are in motion, Bey tries to resurrect his beloved, finding her likeness reincarnated in a young woman named Helen. His villainous plans goes badly, as one would expect from any 1930s universal horror picture, and he is in the end destroyed. The film didn't have the same cultural impact as Dracula and Frankenstein, but it was still considered a superior 1930s horror film. The reason for its success was the way it tied together the modern mythology that grew from Carter and Carnarvon's Egyptian adventure, and because of the horror fantasy storyline about an ancient evil awakening and threatening the colonial way of life, which was, at the time, finally waning. The Mummy was also effective because it was well made and atmospheric. It certainly earned its place in Universal's golden age of horror. After the success of the first one, Universal Pictures weren't done with The Mummy. A series of low-budget shockers popped up in the 1940s. They were further removed from the Carter and Carnarvon years, and they were all released during the Second World War. The culture weren't with them, and even though they were commercially successful, none of these films are particularly memorable. They simply seem like cash-grab monster films, without anything to say about their culture, other than perhaps, boo. In 1955, the comedy team Abbott and Costello got in on the action, meeting the mummy. Abbott and Costello had in the waning years of their career been meeting all kinds of monsters. The most successful film had been Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, today considered their finest work and a comedy classic. Alas, such was not the case for Abbott and Costello meet the mummy. The comedy duo had, after years of success, begun repeating themselves too much. Jokes were recycled from film to film, and they were now falling out of favor with the public. This was the duo's penultimate film, and one of their worst. Both they and The Mummy itself seemed stale, old news in an age of science fiction films and atomic monsters. Of Universal's original Mummy films, only the first one from 1932 seemed to catch the zeitgeist. I think this was because it stayed close to the cultural interest of the Carter and Carnarvon excavations, taking its inspiration directly from them. In 1959, a new series of mummy films went into production at Hammer Studios in England. These films harken back to the British imperialist culture. That was the thing about Hammer films. They had a brief window of popularity when they celebrated British heritage, from everything like Sherlock Holmes stories to British literary works like Dracula and Frankenstein. It was only natural that Hammer should delve into mummy lore, as it was preeminently English. Carter and Carnarvon were subjects of the king, and the original mummy from 1932 had been particularly successful in the UK, more so than in most other territories. Naturally, Hammer films showed interest in the subject. The first Hammer mummy film is one of their more effective entries, it is a lean shocker, with a strong lead performance by the always wonderful Peter Cushing. Christopher Lee is perhaps a bit underused beneath all that makeup, but he is still an imposing presence. The film celebrates its own Britishness and makes for a good time for Hammer film fans. But nostalgia has a shelf life, and Hammer Studios soon found itself becoming irrelevant in the horror landscape that was constantly evolving and exploring new enemies like serial killers, devils, and zombies. Hammer tried to stick with it, making three more mummy movies. None of them are direct sequels, instead retelling a similar story again and again. The first two, The Curse of the Mummy's Tomb and The Mummy's Shroud, do nothing particularly original. In fact, they seem to be more re-threads of the 1959 film. The last Hammer Mummy film was produced in 1972, 
Blood from the Mummy's Tomb tried a slightly different approach, adapting Bram Stoker's The Jewel of Seven Stars, focusing more on possession than on a bandaged monster stumbling about. It didn't turn things around for Hammer films, which were at the time outcompeted by either far more classy horror films coming out of Hollywood or far more brutal efforts from independent filmmakers. Hammer Studios soon shuttered. Bram Stoker's 1903 novel was again adapted in 1980, with The Awakening. At its release, the film seemed kind of old-fashioned, compared to the horror fair that came out that same year. Here's Johnny! <laughs> only a couple of years later, Egyptians themselves got in on the horror action with the English-language Dawn of the Mummy. That film increased violence and gore, but again, it didn't connect with the zeitgeist, and didn't seem very relevant. Aside from a few guest appearances in Nostalgia Trip Fair, the mummy genre was pretty much dead. Enter writer-director Stephen Summers, a playful filmmaker who loved the original 1932 film, and thought it would work well as an action-adventure in the Indiana Jones realm, with just enough flashes of horror to qualify as a member of the genre. The 1999 film was extraordinarily successful, spawning two sequels and a spin-off series about the Scorpion King. Why was it so successful? Well, it is a lot of goofy fun, but it strayed more towards action fantasy than horror. However, it still qualifies as a horror film, though it is closer in mood to Abbott and Costello than to Boris Karloff. The 1999 film adopted a lot of the old tropes from classic monster movies yet it played with them in a contemporary way that audiences responded to. Today, the Stephen Sommers mummy films aren't considered particularly strong or beloved, but as an audience member who saw them opening weekend back when they came out, I can bear witness to the fact that the public adored them. They were perfect, lightweight popcorn entertainment. It doesn't matter if they were deep or complex, because they did everything they set out to do, and they did it well. Yes, these mummy films were old-fashioned in many ways, with all the tropes of the genre resurrected. What have we done? Their popularity seemed to have more to do with their sense of roller coaster fun. The core idea of the mummy as a monster didn't really connect as well. He was never truly a scary monster, or a monster we cared much about. The heart of the Stephen Sommers movies were the silly and charming relationships between his heroic characters. Whoa! I think perhaps the reason was that the mummy as a bad guy seemed landlocked to the 1920s. It helped that the films were set in that era, but that wasn't enough to lift the villain to the mysterious scary level he needed to be. Trying to keep the franchise fresh, the filmmakers changed the action to China for the third film. Sadly, the Rob Cohen directed film doesn't work. The Chinese setting and Jet Li's mummy didn't make things fresh. Despite being a commercial success, the planned fourth film didn't materialize, which is too bad because we've seen very few Aztec mummies in cinema history. Without the infectious fun of director Steven Sommers, there was little else for audiences to connect with in Tomb of the Dragon Emperor. Around the same time, a spin-off series about the Scorpion King debuted. The first film was a theatrical release, featuring a heroic take on the bad guy introduced in The Mummy Returns. The film did okay, and its sequels continued doing okay as a series of straight-to-video films in the golden age of DVDs. While far less interesting than the main series, The Scorpion King gave us The Rock as a movie star, and for that I'm grateful. The Mummy had worked in 1932, in 1959, and in 1999. Universal wasn't going to let the fun end there. This all leads us to the most recent entry in the Mummy mythology, starring a miscast Tom Cruise. The film turns the tables and gives us a female mummy, though it could be argued that this wasn't a new idea. The film also tried to focus more on the horror aspect than the Stephen Sommers' predecessors. 2017's The Mummy is just a touch more brutal, with less comedy, more action, and darker camera work and production design. Also, the film takes place in a contemporary setting, all in an effort to compete with Marvel's shared universe. Universal wanted The Mummy to be the first in a series of dark universe horror films, akin to those the studio had made in the 1940s. 
Never mind that the original Mummy was never part of the 1940s shared monsters universe. Not that this necessarily matters. A good film would have overcome such minor issues, but critics and audiences alike called the Mummy derivative and unfocused. Some critics complained that it copied elements from An American Werewolf in London and from Life Force, and then tried to marry those horror elements with a Tom Cruise action film, complete with the Resequit plane scene. And I agree, the Dark Universe tried to cram in way too much, and instead of focusing on making a good film, they wanted to set up a whole series of other, later films. Yes, you can set up other films and sequels and spin-offs successfully, but to do so, you have to tell a good story. The Mummy with Tom Cruise forgot about that, and the plot goes wildly off the rails somewhere around the midpoint. In the end, The Mummy 2017 just didn't connect. It didn't have what the earlier successful Mummy horror films had. The original used the zeitgeist and was ripped from the headlines. The first Hammer entry to the series was steeped in British Empire nostalgia, with a good dose of at the time acceptable xenophobia. And the Steven Summers film, and its first sequel, were so well made by a gleeful filmmaker who loved the material that nobody cared if it was all a bit old-fashioned. So why didn't the old monster work in 2017? Perhaps it was also part of the culture. Shared universes are all the rage these days, at least as far as studios are concerned, but audiences embraced other monsters in 2017. It was a banner year for horror cinema, with titles like Get Out, Split, Happy Death Day, Annabelle Creation, and It setting the box office ablaze. Compared to these, The Mummy didn't cut it. There was no way to make audiences care for it, or fear it, or want to see it. Simply, the culture was against it, cursing it to obscurity. Yes, I said curse. The curse of the mummy is that it can't always be relevant. It doesn't have enough of its own established personality to matter, unlike Dracula or Frankenstein or the Wolfman, who will always connect on some level. The mummy needs something outside itself to make it relevant to audiences. It needs zeitgeist. It needs to be with the times. There has to be a good reason for someone to make a new mummy film. It would need reinvention. The tropes we've seen time and again are becoming thread-worn, if you'll pardon the pun. So in conclusion, let's look at The Mummy in another light. I once read a quip online that The Mummy is nothing but a rich and privileged zombie. Not quite true, but funny, so let's run with it. If zombies could be reinvented and become the most relevant monster of the 2010s, then why can't mummies do the same? I'm sure they could, in the right hands, but we won't know if it works until it happens. If somebody is going to reinvent the mummy and make it speak to a new generation of audiences, it has to come from an artistic sensibility, like George Romero did in Night of the Living Dead, or like Stephen Summers did in 1999. But then again, I'm quite happy with most of the mummy films we've gotten so far, and I really don't feel a need for a new take. If it never happens, there will be plenty of other monsters to replace mummies. Monsters where we as audiences don't know all the beats. And that is the curse of the mummy. It is landlocked in time, tied to the 1920s, nearly a hundred years in our past. I'm not sure it can truly resurrect itself in the digital age, but I would be delighted if somebody proved me wrong. My name is Wolfcraft. You've been watching History of Horror, if you liked this episode, consider sharing and subscribing. And join me next time for episode 11, the female point of view in Hitchcock films. I am also an author. My science fiction novel, God of Desolation, is available on Amazon. And my upcoming mystery novel, Richly Drawn, is available for pre-order at inkshares.com. Thanks aplenty.